Hey everyone and welcome back to another story time video. In this video we're going to be looking at the subreddit r slash malicious compliance. If you're not already a subscriber do consider subscribing so that you never miss out on another video. But for now let's sit back relax and enjoy these funny reddit stories. Sent home for dress code violation. Cause managers to reassess priorities. Some years ago, in the early 2000s, I worked at a call centre for a major self storage company. It was an excellent job in many ways. The pay was reasonable, the job came with opportunities for promotion, and if you showed specific skills or talents, you'd often get a chance to apply them. My talents run to customer service, problem solving, diplomacy, and writing. So I was placed on what they called the support desk, where I would handle calls from property managers and customers all across the country when a reservation went away for any reason whatsoever. Not to boast, but rather to make clear my value to the company in this role. I won an award at the annual company party for my performance after only 6 months on that job. Unfortunately, about a year after I took on the assignment, I found myself facing a major mental health crisis and turned in my 2 weeks notice. A year later, I reapplied for my old job, but there was no opening on support staff, so they assigned me to sales until a slot opened up. Fine. I was grateful for the work, and they would still occasionally pull me off the phone to help with administrative duties or to assist with tricky reservation issues. So I wasn't just maddeningly repeating the same script all day. Problem was, the operations manager for the centre had quit in disgust when his boss got in his face over some minor charges on an expense report for a business trip. This man had been a genius at his job. Letting people go early on some days, and calling in those favours for overtime when there weren't enough people signing up for it. His replacement was nice, but in over her head, and our numbers of dropped calls had increased while she learned the ropes. Additionally, one of the supervisors in charge of compliance was going through something in his personal life and had started taking it out on the workers in increasingly petty ways. My new supervisor would never stand up to him. It had become an unpleasant working environment, not quite toxic, but headed in that direction. During the summer months, we experienced crunch times, when we received an enormously high volume of calls. The kids are out of school, so that's when most families move. This meant a certain number of perks to increase morale. Free lunches from local casual dining places, mildly annoying theme days, and a relaxing of the office's business casual dress code. One night, going home at the end of my shift, I saw notices being posted. I didn't bother reading them, as I was exhausted from being slammed with calls on top of the other duties I was given that day. I returned the following day wearing black jeans and saw that crunch time was officially over meaning that we were back to normal. We were, however, still getting an enormously high call volume, so I sat at my cubicle and put in my earpiece. After one hour, I was tapped on the shoulder by my immediate supervisor and told to get off the phones. The compliance manager had noticed that I'm wearing jeans and is insisting that I go home to change, then come back to work. Can't I just get verbal warning or something? We're getting heavy call volume. No luck. The compliance manager insists. Fine. Thing is, I don't have a car. I ride a bus. I ride the bus in Los Angeles, where service is improving, but at the time it was notoriously inconsistent and shoddy. I don't bother informing them of this. Instead, I wait for the bus for about 45 minutes, then take a ride of slightly over an hour to get home. When I get there, I find a pair of pants on my floor that I've worn once and would undoubtedly pass muster if I were to wear them back to work. However, the company dress code states that all items of apparel must be clean so I decide to wash them. Unfortunately, it turns out that both our washer and dryer are occupied by another roommate. I could explain to him that this is an emergency, but instead, I let him do all of his laundry uninterrupted. My phone rings. It's my supervisor. I explain the situation. We need you back here now. Our team is getting slammed and we're dropping calls because we're not fully staffed. I re-explain the situation and also state that as I ride the bus, there's no way that I could realistically be back before two hours were up. He tells me to get a taxi. I ask him if the company will reimburse me. He says no. I tell him that a 12 mile cab ride isn't in my budget and that I'll do my best. He tells me that this is unacceptable. I remind him that I was willing to take a warning in order to be able to stay at my desk and that I'm not going to work in dirty pants or I'm going to run the risk of being sent home again. My roommate finishes. I wash the pants along with the rest of my laundry. I then dry them, take each item out separately, fold them, take a shower, change into my business casual clothes and make it back to work with 30 minutes left on my shift. The next day, I'm called into the office of the sales supervisor. Both my immediate supervisor and the compliance manager are there. 
I am handed a written warning, the second most serious disciplinary action, for missing work without permission. I yet again explained the sequence of events and stressed that I initially asked to stay at work and was willing to have a verbal warning on my record for the clothing issue. She asks my immediate supervisor if this was the case. He, to his credit, says yes, but that they were trying to make a point to the other sales staff. She asks me to go back to my desk and to close the door behind me. Shortly afterwards, I see the vice president in charge of the call center head towards her office. The four of them remain behind closed doors for some time. The next day, I'm informed that my written warning has been downgraded to a verbal one and I am reminded to check all notices before leaving for the day. I agree to do so, as that was careless on my part. Word then goes out that a minor first time dress code violators will be subject to a verbal warning, but are expected to stay at work, especially during heavy call periods. I later found out that after I had been sent home, two other people on our team also had to leave. One for medical emergency, the other one for a family issue, and we'd had our worst call retention numbers since my immediate supervisor had been placed in charge of the team. Also, the operations manager was in some hot water for not staffing that shift sufficiently. A bit wordy, I know, and the comeuppance wasn't particularly dramatic, but that was fun. And that, my friends, is a fine example of policy getting in the way of purpose. Some managers just need a bit of common sense now and again. Never mess with a landlord, then ask for a reference. So I'm a property manager of the house I live at for discounted rent. This means I am in charge of taking care of the property, finding tenants, making sure rent gets paid on time. Basic things that a property manager does. So I had a friend who was looking for a place to live with his girlfriend, and since I knew them, I figured I would help them out. I was able to convince the owner to give them a discount on rent, about $300 lower than market value. In exchange, I told my friend that I would need help with maintaining the property. Stuff like maintaining the garden, keeping up with the trash, ensuring the house is kept clean. Pretty basic for a 26 and 28 year old to do, right? Well, for the first month or so, it was perfect. House was maintained, it was like four adults lived there. After the 30 day test period went by and we signed the year lease, their true natures surfaced. Saying that I lived with pigs would be insulting actual pigs. It started out small, a bowl left out for a day or two here, some trash accidentally left on the floor there. Then, it started accumulating. Suddenly, my basement and garage became the storage space for them, their family and their friends stuff. You'd think, hey, at least it's organized and not in the walkway, right? Nope, it was everywhere. I wouldn't be able to get into the garage because a bunch of stuff would be cluttered everywhere. Dishes would be left in the sink for weeks. Bathroom wouldn't be cleaned unless I started doing it. Black mold started growing in the bathroom. Other forms of mold would be growing in the kitchen because they wouldn't clean up after themselves. We'd get ants every day because they couldn't wipe down a counter after spilling sauce. When I did the housewalk though, their room would look like a tornado and a hoarder had a baby. Slight exaggeration? Nope. Their pet would poop and pee around the house and they wouldn't clean it. The smell was the final straw for me. I didn't understand how we could have four cats and six litter boxes around the house. Yet somehow, those areas smelled better than when I walked past their bedroom door. Keep in mind, their door led to a staircase and their actual bedroom was upstairs. They must have let trash accumulate for months. Finally, after about seven months, I sent them a very professional and polite message saying that after their lease is up, it would not be renewed. I told them we would not be kicking them out. However, if they wanted to move out early, I would accept a 30 day notice and not do any charge for the early termination and I offered to give them their security deposit in full without anything taken out if they left early. That's when stuff hit the fan. One of the tenants completely blew up on me, basically calling me a bunch of names, saying I was a horrible friend and threatening to sue me for breaking the lease. I repeatedly told them that I was not kicking anyone out and simply not renewing the lease. For the remainder of their time, they decided to continue to let the house get worse and I ended up having to get a cleaning service to help with the house. Two months prior to their lease ending, they were several weeks late with their rent and coming up with an excuse every time I asked. They gave me their 30 day notice and then told me because they did me a favour of moving out early, I should waive their entire rent for the last two months. I was livid, but wanted to just get them out, so I paid the owner the money to get them out, costing me an extra $2100 I shouldn't have had to pay. These people decided that since apparently I owed them more favours, they weren't going to change their address, so it looks like they have a longer residence. So we kept getting their mail for months, which I would just return to the mailman. Then, one of the former tenants sent me a message asking me to be their reference for when they apply for apartments, 
as they've been saying they still live with me. Why, of course I'll be your reference. I started getting emails daily asking questions about said tenants and whether I would want to rent them again. Some of them would include personal statements on what they said about themselves as tenants and asked me if I agreed with them. Now here's where the malicious compliance comes in. I dutifully did what my prior tenants asked. In fact, I'd say I went above and beyond. I answered the reference questions with complete honesty and even included pictures of the state of the house and conversations. I took every phone interview that was requested. It was quite satisfying hearing the other property managers thank me for my honesty. Last I heard, they are living in someone's basement for almost double of what it's worth. Hey everyone, I hope you're all having a really good day and that you enjoyed that video. If you did, remember to leave a like on it because it really helps out the channel. The growth recently has been amazing so thank you to every single one of you that subscribed. But thank you again and I will see you tomorrow.